but we are just at the beginning of this next crisis and people need to get into position and stop procrastinating if they've been procrastinating, which is how they make these transitions anyway. Getting the public to agree to the shift without them understanding or realizing what shift has taken place. But then we come into the real thing that nobody's talking about is what happens when the credit locks up or there's no available credit for our farmers to borrow, to plant the fields, to get the food in for the year. It is. And good afternoon, everyone. Today with me, Lynette Zhang. We've had a couple of talks before. Always on finance, the economy, a little bit of prepping, homesteading. So how do you wind this into one single, well, vision of the future and more of the trend, how it's going to go? And then if we encounter some problems, then how could we pre-prepare -pre ourselves? So when their problem arises, you're just like, okay, this is my next step. I've already planned it. Instead right. of just being caught totally off guard. Uh, founder and CEO, Zhang Enterprises. And you can jump over to the site there, LynetteZhang.com. Now, here's the interesting thing. Lynette and I had talked back, what, 2017 about AC Chain way back in the day, because China was digitizing assets in terms of rice. There was a type of tea called pu'er cha. It's a kind of a brick and they squeeze it and it's uh, the longer it ages, the more valuable it becomes. So if you can have it in a properly humidity controlled room and that increases asset value. So the pu'er cha that we were talking about 2017 would probably be worth thousands of dollars per uh, round that was stamped by now because the, the longer it ages, the the more it's worth. And they were digitizing real estate. We talked about that, about how could you digitize an asset and then transfer ownership to something else. And suddenly these days, there's a whole class of new cryptocurrencies called real world assets or RWAs, which brings me into some of the questions for today with Lynette. Okay. So if you get your mortgage bailed in, and if there's a major bank failure, there's already a plan to bail in your savings, your safety deposit boxes, your mortgage, all assets, your car loan, auto loan, everything you have, possibly your boat loan, anything is going to be bailed in. And this is where I get confused because I understand the bail-in process. So then, Lynette, where does that leave us? They, there's two options rolling down. They could digitize everything after it gets bailed in. But then who owns anything? If my property's paid off or if I'm under note still, if I owe, if I want to my last payment, I think you kind of get the idea where I want to roll with this conversation today, but uh, I'll let you go with it because again, this stock market crash brings us full circle to you and I both looking for the starting gun for this very event. And I cannot believe after all these years, real world assets are here and the starting gun of the very same event that we had both talked about is here. Yes, that's that's really, uh, you know, something a divine intervention to get us at this, even though we'd scheduled this interview a long time ago to put us right at this time. I think so many people are going to enjoy it. And and please take this information to heart. This is the way you protect yourself moving forward. Thanks oh. Lynette, for joining me. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, David. You are definitely one of my most favorite and brilliant people. And I've done a lot of things because of your work. So let's talk about mortgages because I believe that the hyperinflationary event has already begun as witnessed by the velocity of money, the, the number of times that money changes hands, ratcheting up in a very pervasive way. It turns out the key to losing weight and keeping it off is not carbs or fat or even probiotic rich foods. Nope, the end game of having a healthy weight as well as more energy and a long, healthy life comes down to a specific switch which you can flip in your body to flush out unnecessary calories. Dr. Stephen Gundry is calling this caloric bypass. And by activating this specific process in your body, he's seen thousands, yes, thousands of people dramatically improve their health even at age 50 and beyond. This includes losing weight, getting tons more energy, and returning to the good health that they had in their youth once they simply addressed this one key to better health. Dr. Stephen Gundry has lost 70 pounds himself using this research and has kept the weight off for over 20 years and counting. His digestive issues are gone, his health is fantastic, and he feels younger and healthier today than he did in his 40s. 
His video has been watched by over 20 million people to date, and you can watch and learn more about it at thehealthyfat.com forward slash adapt. And he'll teach you exactly how he's kept his weight off for free at thehealthyfat.com forward slash adapt. Click on that link in the description box below. And now on with the video. So what happened this, well, it's been coming for the last couple of weeks, but what happened on Monday, I do believe, well, what happened on Friday was a trigger event for sure. And then we saw the fallout on Monday. Now the central banks are backtracking, right? The Bank of Japan is saying, oh, well, if, if the markets are volatile, we won't raise rates anymore. I mean, you know, I, I think that it's pretty clear who's running the show and it's not the central banks anymore that I believe that scale has tipped to Wall Street. So the next, you know, when they go to just print this money like crazy, right? That'll bring on the obvious hyperinflation. And I think we're going into a hyperinflationary depression. So let's talk about mortgages because if you have any debt, so it could be mortgages or car loans or anything, you will be in a position where you have to restructure that debt. And that in that restructuring event is where you are most likely to find the ability to digitize you know, all these asset backed cryptos, right? That's what they're talking about. And then, then it would be broken down so that you're carrying around any equity on your phone and then they encourage you to just spend that equity so the equity in your home can be anywhere in the world. But it will be most likely from some kind of event that gets you to agree to it even though you're not going to really realize that that's what's happening. Now, if your mortgage is paid off or if you're executing the strategy like we are, which is about buying undervalued gold right now, and then when they do that overnight revaluation to attempt to get people's confidence back and restructure everything, well, you know, you will typically have maybe a nine month window because they can't just go in and restructure if your house is paid off, right? So you want to make sure that you've got enough gold so that your house can be paid off, but you have to make sure that you can pay your property taxes because that's really that next big threat to your ownership of that property. You, you don't really ever own it. It's classified as immovable property because you can't put it on your back and walk away, right? That's why they don't like you in physical gold and physical silver because you can put it in your pocket and walk away, but you can't do that with real estate. So as long as your, your mortgage is paid off legally, they can't just restructure it, but what they will likely do is entice you, encourage you, or what they call nudging you to agree to that, right? But it, it's the property taxes. So, you know, I, I like raw gold for that kind of thing, different sizes, and there are ways to calculate out how much you're gonna need. But any debt that you hold, that's really what puts you in jeopardy if you aren't prepared to deal with that debt. And any variable rate debt that you hold, forget it, you're never getting out of debt because if you have debt, they will be able to, if you, so if you still hold a mortgage, what is the most likely scenario, because this is what history tells us, is that they will then tie your interest rates to the rate of inflation. So all of a sudden, your payments are ratcheting up. And when you can't pay it, think about what happened in 2008. They restructured all of those, a lot of those mortgages rather than having people walk away from them, right? So you wanna be prepared to be, and this is what we've talked about, and you've helped me with this as well, to be as independent and self-sufficient as possible and with food, water, energy, security, barterability, which for me is silver, wealth preservation, 
community, which is what you and I have been doing for many years now, building this community because we have to come together and shelter. These are the things that we need to sustain a reasonable standard of living, but to also have the ability to say no when they're trying to push you in a direction. I mean, if you're hungry and they say jump and you don't have any other alternative, you're gonna have to say how high. I want you to not, I want, I would love us to all just take our power back so that we can say no, but we have to be a whole lot more independent than we are right now. Yeah, those are good words, because even if you think you're a family with cute kids and you got the wife and four of you are just going to go knock on your neighbor's door, you're going to go a couple doors down and you think people are going to feed you. Uh, that is in an emergency situation. People are going to take care of themselves first, unless it's your very best friend and they know you have skills that can help out. Well, you know, even me, if you come out, I might know you, but. You know, in the beginning, perhaps, but if things got real sticky, uh, there's no way people are just going to freely start handing out food and then you're like okay we're gonna go see the next neighbor we're trick-or-treating for food today that yeah. trick-or-treating mentality of your survival for your family is not going to work you need to get pre-prepared for this so you know then i wanted to continue on that same point there so if i have my house paid off and i say you know what i don't want to go into the new system is that possible to stay out outside that firewall? And then, because here in Tennessee, it's legal now to pay your property taxes in gold and silver. They passed that legislation last year. So gold and silver, we can actually pay our property taxes with. We don't have to convert it to fiat and then go in. But uh, I'm curious, you know, A, can you stay out if you freehold your property? But B, if you have that, like when they're talking about restructuring on a, is everything going to get restructured at a variable rate? mortgages and if we're talking about hyperinflation you know some of those things were you know three million four hundred thousand percent you know and all these inflationary events we've seen from zimbabwe to austria or in the early days 1923 uh if we go back to weimar you know you take a look at venezuela currently today so if you're talking about a floating rate are you that could be millions of percent yes that could be that's why you know i i look i'm not a lawyer so I can't really speak to that other than, you know, I take a look at history and if your debt is paid off, I don't know that they can force you to digitize. It is, and if they try to force you, they'd probably get pushback. And if you read all of their documentation, what they like is distance from their policy to how it is introduced to the public because they do not want the public to understand that this is all part of the policy just like going cashless which with the recent events with crowdstrike and microsoft 365 i mean you know when when are people going to heed these warnings um but a contract if you own it outright i don't know how they could force it on you, it would be more an enticement to get you to cooperate and get you to digitize it. Now, if you're squeezed enough and you don't have sound money outside of the system, then you might be forced to digitize your assets. But I can tell you that I'm not going to choose to do that because then you give up control and the nudging this is a consumer driven world now you know even in china they've been developing the consumerism over there so this is a consumer driven world we're seeing with ai and the advent of ai i mean you don't even necessarily know that it's a fake but i mean i, I don't really like it makes me very nervous to see for our children and our future all of the different technologies that are really based upon full sur surveillance and full control, like implanting something in your brain. But don't worry, they're not gonna, gonna control how you think or how you behave. So, I mean, legally, I don't see how they can suddenly force you to do that. I think it would make their plan way too visible. So unless they felt that they had complete control where it didn't matter, um, I think it's more of an enticement for you to participate in it. Like maybe they give you something to make it seem, and which is how they make these transitions anyway. 
they, they want it to be as normal as possible. And then they want the public to feel like they're ahead, right? The greedy 80s, the roaring 20s. Whenever we had these major shifts, even what we've seen in cryptocurrencies since 2009, right, has really been about getting the public to agree to the shift without them understanding or realizing what shift has taken place. And I think that this would be the same because the last thing they want is pushback, David. They don't want pushback. Yeah, they're going to have to entice you. I remember I got a free toaster and 5% for a CD back in the 80s. Like, where's my free toaster again? I will digitize my house for a free toaster. I mean, they're going to try to, you know, try something like this or give you, you know, a year's worth of food to digitize your thing after there's starvation going along. It's kind of strange, you know, the things they could ask for you to get the enticement. And who owns that? Now, this is another question for you. Then who owns that contract? So, so the process of digitization is like they take my farm property and they'll assign a value to it on how many acres I have. So they could dissect that by one acre or a full property uh, and encapsulated in a value. Now, once they have that value wrapped in there, then that's actually something tangible that can loans could be put out against that or new money could be printed to then continue the debt. And they'd probably, you know, you know better than I, how many times they would roll that 10 to one or 99 times unknown. But who owns that? Once the smart contract's written, see, that's the thing. There needs to be a smart contract behind the asset, but somebody has to issue it. There's an issuer of that smart contract. And then the holder of it, like who owns the private keys to that contract? And these are some unknowns too, if you're coming into the digitization space of who owns it, who's issuing the contract, and then who holds the keys to it? Because if you don't own the keys, you don't own it. If you don't hold physical gold or silver, you don't own it either. Exactly. And that's what people really, we have been trained away from that so much. And this is a really good point because if you don't hold it, you don't own it. It's all counterparty risk. And, you know, to your point on the digitization, they actually talked about, so we'll see what it looks like, but they actually talked about breaking it down into very small little chunks. So not an acre, but maybe a thousandth of an acre so that what you've got on your phone is the equivalent of like a dollar or something like that. So now you can go to the store and you, you talk about food. There are a lot of people that are putting their grocery bills on their flipping credit cards or taking out those, those loans where they're paying it, you know, four weeks, breaking it down. I mean, this is scary. This is really scary stuff. But to your point, if you're hungry and they say, okay, all you have to do is digitize this, who would own it? Whoever owns that smart contract would own it. That's who would. And it can be anywhere in the world. Because even though we're watching um, the, in the, well, at least in the manufacturing and in the services sector, the breakdown of globalization, we are seeing a consolidation of globalization in the monetary system. And I still go back to the original one that we talked about way back in 2017 or 2016 when we had that first conversation. I believe it's going to be the IMF because they are working furiously on an overarching global currency, which is the SDR. And all they have to do is put everybody's local currencies, so dollars, yen, euro, whatever, inside of this. And they are technocrats, unelected officials that really you know, they said they wanted to be. Now they're going to say, no, we don't own it, but they're going to be controlling all of it. So who really owns it? They're going to encourage you to spend it. Yeah, the transference of new ownership of that too. So say it comes under control of an American bank in the beginning, but then they offload some of that debt assets to, uh, let's say they would need to settle somewhere and they want to, okay, we're going to settle. We're going to send you this much of property in East Tennessee, and we'll swoop it over there. Well, then the Saudis own it. Oh, hey, we need that whole area, eminent domain. We're taking everybody, get off your farms because we're going to put a data center here, or we're going to put a, uh, we're going to scrape everything clean. And it was already previously farmland. We're just going to bulldoze all the homes. And then we got 3,000 acres of farmland, but just everybody needs to get off of it. 
Yeah. So, you know, you start to look at that in the initial part of the digitization and the bank bail-ins, okay, you might be safe for a X amount of time, but once those transfers start, for settlement of debt or transference of debt or consolidation into like they did in 2008 and nine, they just bundled all those mortgages into just like one giant monetary behemoth of it's worth this, it's worth 5 billion. Okay, now I got a $5 billion smart contract comprised of, you know, 50,000 properties or 100,000 properties and this, and then it can be moved as a, okay, what if somebody, the, 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 the transferent takes it and says, well, let's split this apart and see what we got in here. Oh, we got all these farms. Look at all we can do all this. Okay, everybody out. Right. But, then then what really, I mean, they're going to lose control in a matter of microseconds, the way the internet and how fast wealth can move across the planet in terms of like transfers. Oh, it, in one day, you know, and they're going to sell it like, okay, here's the string of ownership, right? The smart contracts and the blockchain. Here's the string of ownership. You should do this because then it makes, if you want to sell it, makes it so much easier, so much faster. It eliminates the, it eliminates a lot of the costs of selling a property because you're selling it in itty bitty bites. And before you know it, you've sold it all and you will own nothing, but I don't think you're going to be happy. So they're so, going to allow you to transfer equity out of that. So if I need to buy groceries, then I can take $500 out of that. <clears throat> so the equity will never accrue again. So it's kind of going to be at a cap. So once it's reached maximum value and that smart contract's locked in, there's no more appraiser. Uh, there's no way for that to increase in value. So our land prices went from here from about $4,000 an acre to 12000 So, you know, there's some value in there, some extra equity that I got because I have a few acres out here. Okay then that means from time immemorial that when it caps there, that'll never even add one more penny. And I'm just going to start drawing out of that, like some kind of IRA or my life savings. And once it goes to zero, then I need to leave the house or what's, what's going on that? I mean, basically, you know, we're going to see who's, how this actually unfolds, but I would anticipate that all of the leverage that they put on top of your holdings would make it appear like it's going up in value because they need you to feel wealthy enough to not just to spend it on and you wouldn't have to take five hundred dollars or whatever out to buy groceries you just show them your phone here you go whatever that grocery is and that's even more dangerous because if you're taking out 500 what are you going to hold that in cbdc's right so whereas you could go to the grocery store and you spend a dollar here, you spend $20 there, you spend $100 there, you don't realize that you're spending your equity until it's all gone. And so I think that they would actually want to inflate those prices to begin with, because remember, the way they make these transitions and getting the public to agree to it is they make it appear like the public is getting ahead like the public is winning the roaring 20s was the first time when they actually extended um debt without anything to back it up right they were transitioning us into a consumer driven economy and the general public had access to credit like they never did before and so they're watching the Wall Street crowd and they're seeing the market go up, 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 up. And now they have access to all of this credit. So they took it on. Well, what happened to the middle class during that period of time? For a while, the Roaring Twenties, happy days are here again. Isn't that awesome? Until they take that credit punch bowl away in a massive wealth transfer. And if you look at what happened in the 70s, you know, one of the things I think is really interesting is they, when these crises occur, they always harken back to what was happening in 1987, like Monday was like 1987. Well, I was a new stockbroker in 1987. I know what that looks like, smells like, tastes like, but the difference is, is that was after that conspicuous, the greedy 80s, that conspicuous consumption where all of the assets inflated and people were really pushed to spending in excess and having, you know, the big shoulder pads and the big hair and, you know, and all of that. Mall hair, yeah. You remember that? Dallas. Hair, I loved it. I mean, I had hair back then. <laughs> I did have hair back then too. I still do, but it wasn't gray. <laughs> it is now. 
But the central banks, well, the banks were tasked with managing the rate and speed of inflation, right? So inflation, they print a whole bunch of money, right? Makes everything look like it's going up, up, up. And then they take that credit punch bowl away. So by 87, when I was a new stockbroker, that was the beginning of that. And they had a lot of ramp room in interest rates because I remember putting, when I first started, I was at Shearson and I was able to get treasuries at like 10%, 12%, something like that, right? So they had ramp room then because that was the beginning. There is no room now because they were anchored, the central banks were anchored at zero for 15 years, attempting to raise rates into this environment has created this next crisis that I, I'm with you, David. I think that, uh, you know, this is a dead cat bounce that we're seeing. I talked about it. You saw the markets gap down, meaning they closed here and they opened down here. And I think all that's happening right now is that gap is traders are moving in and filling that gap. But we are just at the beginning of this next crisis and people need to get into position and stop procrastinating if they've been procrastinating. Yeah, I'm gonna pretty much say time's up, like really seriously on a no BS <clears throat> assessment, time's up. So I wanna walk you down a very dark alley in the middle of the night, could be a scary place to be. But if the credit dries up, our farming revolves on credit. Like, you know, farmers, like me, I have a small farm. I do pay for some things, but with the co-op, I'm allowed to go out on credit and get more. So if I need a hundred gallons of gas, and if I, I do have the money, I always have money. But if I didn't have the money, they would allow me to go on credit and buy a thousand gallons. They just need to write, make sure I have the right storage tank, come out and test it, make sure it <clears throat> meets specs. And, you know, they do a visual inspection, kind of, you know, put whatever they do down lights in there to make sure <clears throat> my storage facility for petrol is OK. Anything I want, if I want a, a new 50 foot long greenhouse, high tunnel, I can get it on credit. That's me. I'm a small farm. You know, they'll offer me 50 grand in like a, a second to put more stuff out of my farm. And they actually, FSA encourages you to take these small, they call micro loans. You got to get this. 50 grand is a micro loan in farming. 50,000, that's a micro loan out here. So when you start to looking at somebody who has 100,000 acres, that's an agribusiness. There's no way they're pre buy. you know, they're not paying cash for their fuel. They're not paying cash for their seed. Nobody and all the crew out there that's doing uh, maintenance on the vehicles, repair these sort of things. Nobody's buying tires. They're, you know, they're extra materials laying around everywhere. Uh, the processing, the haul bills, everything for the harvesting, you know, they, they wait, they, you know, even when they send it to the silos, there's still a, a matter of time before they put that in, book it before they actually get paid to come around. Everything's revolving on credit. So while I, I'm in the middle of New York City, back in the day in the eighties, when it was real crime ridden, I'm down a dark alley by myself. And here we got no credit for farming. Then what happens, Lynette? This is my real question to you. Okay, so banking is one thing. You might have your home, home mortgage thing. That's another thing, your car loan. Okay, that's like subset A spinning off over here. But then we come into the real thing that nobody's talking about is what happens when the credit locks up or there's no available credit for our farmers to borrow, to plant the fields, to get the food in for the year? Yeah, this is a huge problem. And you know, to your point, they encourage you to take on more and more debt. And what is that saying? If I owe you $100,000, I have a problem. If I owe you a million dollars, you have a problem. And so really that is about taking everything over and, and leverage. And we've been watching the number of farms, especially in the US, shrink more and more narrow. We're watching starvation and malnutrition erupt around the world because you can't live without food. You can't live without water and you can't live without food. Those are the two things you cannot live without. And so to your point, what ha what's happening? Because the land is a lot more expensive. The cost to farm is a lot more expensive. And do the prices support the, if, if you have to borrow everything, you know, do the prices support your ever getting out of debt? No, it supports whoever is owning that debt to come in and take it over and distribute it 
this is why I started my, my urban farm here in dead central Phoenix. I mean, I was getting ready to retire. I had a little two bedroom condo. It's going to lock the door and off I go, la, la, la. And then 2008 happened and 100% I knew that the system died at that point. So we've got all those years that they have just been piling up more and more and more and more debt. And all that debt can make things look really good or look kind of normal or have this extreme that's the other piece david have you noticed there'll be extreme moves and then if things calm down a little bit they're going oh we're going back to normal we ain't ever going back to normal we're always going into this new normal and food is the single biggest issue for people as we go through these transitions you are the whole reason why I knew to start growing indoors as well as outdoors, but indoors as well so that I can have control of my food. Everybody needs to do that.